Ladies and gentlemen, I trust I find you all safe and well in these extraordinary times. And it is a great disappointment that we were unable by the British Council for Offices uh, to have our conference in Toronto uh, due to the global pandemic. It's such a shame. We did try and reschedule the conference for May 21st, uh, 2021, sorry, but again, the continued pandemic paid, paid to this with containment to foreign travel and country lockdowns. However, we managed to salvage some of the best parts of the conference agenda and have created the Office Reimagined webinar series to be held over the next three weeks. I'm delighted to say that the speakers from the plenary sessions of the Toronto Conference have agreed to partake in the webinar series. And today we're able to hear from the Canadian developers and the disruptors affecting the developers' decisions. I would like to personally thank the Toronto Gold sponsors on behalf of the BCO for so generously supporting my program and sponsoring this webinar series. Those gold sponsors are BDP Quadrangle, Gleeds, Lutron, Skanska, Troop Bywater and Anders, Hare and WSP. Their unequivocal support during these testing times has been truly remarkable and we at the BCO are truly grateful for them. It is with their support that the BCO can continue with the great, its great work delivering the best in class of office specification and requirements for offices both now and in the future. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the plenary panel, panel to you. Chuck Scott is the CEO of Cushman Wakefield in Canada. He has kindly offered to moderate our esteemed panel of speakers for the first webinar. Joining Chuck and representing the developers are Michael Emery, CEO of Allied REIT, Sal Icono, Executive Vice President for Operations, Cadillac Fairview, Jonathan Pierce, Executive Vice President of Leasing and Development, Office and Industrial for North America for Ivanhoe, Cambridge. And giving the disruptors point of view, we have a slight change to the program. Please welcome Craig, Craig Backman, Chief Revenue Office, Officer of ThoughtWire. Unfortunately, Michael Monteith, CEO of ThoughtWire, has been taken ill and we wish him a speedy recovery. Gentlemen, it's an honor to have you with us. I'd like to now hand over to Chuck to moderate this exciting session, which we will hopefully lead to some provocative questions at the end in the Q&A session. So without further ado, over to you, Chuck. Robin, thank you very much <clears throat> for that introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those uh, here in Canada. Uh, as, as Robin mentioned, my name is Chuck Scott. I'm the CEO for Cushman and Wakefield here in Canada. Uh, and I'm just absolutely thrilled <clears throat> to be moderating this panel today with such a great group of, of really esteemed real estate professionals, uh, investors, owners, technology uh, uh, professionals here in Canada. Uh, so looking forward to some, some really great dialogue. Uh, listen, as we, as we turn the corner, hopefully in, in, in what's been going on in this pandemic, it's, it's giving us time to reflect on issues like this no doubt this disruption has been an unprecedented one and it and it's really uh, put a light on uh, a lot of impact zones uh, and a lot of opportunities and it's shaken the foundation uh, of a lot of areas of our world and, and of our business. Uh, commercial real estate is is no is no exception and and there have been impacts and there have been opportunities. We're excited today to, to talk a little bit more specifically and share perspectives around, as Robin said, the future of office. What, what, what is that looking like and, and what has this disruption done uh, uh, both on an on a opportunity and impact area uh, for the investor and the owner of, of real estate? So, so we're excited to have some dialogue today. And as Robin said, we're probably going to spend around 30 minutes or so sharing perspectives, but then there'll be Q&A at the end. So we're del delighted to, to have that. I thought I would spend just a few minutes uh, before we get into the panel discussion, just setting the scene, uh, if you will, on 
on the current world of office and, 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 and sort of how we're seeing it now. Um, Sam, could you put up the slides, please? Great, and maybe we can go right into the first, the first slide. Thanks very much. So, so really starting, it really is an office world. This is a, this is a graph from Moody's and it's showing um, office using employment in Canada. So the definition of office using employment is, is really finance plus IT technology and professional services. And the, the interesting thing to see here is that, that the population of Canada you know, which has sort of grown 20% over the, the last 20 years, office using employment has grown 41% over that same period. So now, now what does that mean? Does that mean everyone is in the office? That's certainly an open question, but what it's showing us is that while COVID kind of briefly changed the office using impact over a couple of quarters, it has been and remains an office using world. Sam, could you go to the next slide, please? Cushman and Wakefield took part in a survey. We actually you know, ran a survey together with Cornet. Many of you might know Cornet uh, as a global occupier organization where we basically you know, did a survey on work intentions before and after COVID. There were 339 people responding. The, the interesting thing here is, is sort of the from to of an office only thinking or a remote only thinking to an office only thinking, there really has been, been a change in that. And I think that over the, the, the COVID period, and it perhaps stands to reason that, that an office first or a hybrid first position is the sentiment of a lot of people right now, um, because a lot of people are missing that. A lot of people are missing that interaction and, and functionality that an office gives. Now, again, we really don't know what office first means right now. That's an open question. Does that mean two days a week? Does that mean um, uh, uh, you know, a flexible work environment? I think the key message is that the hybrid is the future of the office. Could we go to the next slide, please, Sam? What a difference six months makes. This is a KPMG survey that talks about um, CEOs' reaction to how their footprint will 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 look, and and really, if you look at what was what was looked at in 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 August of 20 versus March of 21, there really has been a little bit of a a whiplash between remote forever to back to normal in terms of footprint. Uh, it's possible that a year plus of remote work has really, you know, really soured a little bit of, of, of how people are, are, are feeling about, about this. From an employer's point of view, clearly inability to build culture, uh, onboarding issues, security issues, things like that have sort of flipped their intention. And with employees, just missing that engagement and, and in many cases, increasing working hours and, and a lack of amenities and boundaries, quite frankly, is making them also want to, uh, to get back. So it, it really is interesting what a difference six months makes to the, to the view of a lot of CEOs. Sam, can we go to the next slide, please? So what does this mean? And, and, and this really is the segue into our panel discussion. What does the future hold? I guess we'll wait and see. But from where probably all of us sit and certainly you know, my own point of view is that the office is not going away at all. Uh, its purpose um, and its place in the overall workplace ecosystem will absolutely be reimagined, but the physical office is going to continue to be a big part of the occupancy strategy of big occupiers. And Robin, I know that later on in the series, we're going to hear from some, some great occupiers to, to share their perspectives. And listen, I think those those progressive occupiers have been looking at the role of the office and how it's evolving for quite some time, actually. Uh, really what this pandemic and what this disruption has done is it, it's accelerated that strategic, th that, that strategic thinking. 
And the same applies to owners and investors of real estate. And that really kicks us into today's discussions. Owners and, uh, owners and investors of, of, of office with conviction and with confidence, you know, very much so our panelists today, um, will continue to accelerate their thinking as well and evolve in, in their positions. So I hope that's, that, that helps as a little bit of a backdrop and a scene set for our discussion right now. And maybe we could pull down the slides, Sam, at this point and, and get right into uh, our panel. So great, thank you. So I thought I would open uh, or we would open a little bit with some, just some perspectives of the panelists in general then we're going to go into sort of three impact areas. First being, what, how has this disruption, how has this pandemic um, changed, if at all, or, or, or impacted the investment philosophy and the investment thesis uh, of, of owners? The second is, how is this disruption in office, is it going to change the way we think about, you think about building and designing buildings in, in the future. And then finally, what, what has this done, you know, the lens of an owner and investor in the relationship with the tenant? So those are kind of three impact areas that we're gonna work through. And then we'll have some closing comments from our panelists and, and then of course, Q&A. So let's get right into it with opening uh, perspectives. Michael Emery, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Um, Share your macro view, please. And, and of course, your comments on my scene set. Does that resonate with you? Oh, oh Michael, you might be on mute. Thank you, Chuck. Apologies. Uh, picking up on a comment you made, one of my favorite uh, comments during the pandemic came from a user of space who said to me, I even miss the people I don't like in the office. And, and that struck me as, as both amusing, but also penetrating. Here's my perspective on the pandemic. I think back to just over a year ago when we went into shutdown. The first thing I observed was almost a total loss of visibility it was impossible to discern what was happening, what was going to happen, and what the implications of that were going to be. We then sort of moved into a frenzied mode of speculation where people were sort of lodged in their home offices, speculating wildly about what the implications of this change were, even though visibility hadn't improved, and even though there was no real data to ground the speculation. What I'm happy about now and why your thesis resonates with me is visibility has improved dramatically. Many of us are operating in the real world again. Uh, many of us are conducting leasing tours, concluding lease transactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And much of the data undermines the early speculation and supports your thesis, Chuck. So that's where we are. We're not at a point in time where we can definitively conclude what the future holds and, and what the ultimate impact of the pandemic will be. But we're much closer to that point in time. And it's a much more interesting point in time to my way of thinking. And I think your uh, initial presentation was a very good overview. Good, thank, thank you, Michael. I, I like that comment of, of visibility. And I think that's actually a good way to, to talk about it. And, and that trajectory of how visibility is increasing and will continue to increase. So I think that's a great comment. Thank you. Jonathan Pierce, maybe over to you to share your initial macro views. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll try and put a slightly different perspective. Uh, that being said, I mean, I, I fully agree with Mike. I think, you know, what he said was extremely coherent and, and I would say, you know, largely sort of mirrors our own sort of house view as well. So 
Um, I think what we've tried to do is we've tried to sort of take a good sort of hard look at the sector. I mean, two or three months into it, um, where there was no visibility. I mean, quite frankly, I think a lot of us were quite nervous as to what that meant. And, you know, the duration of the pandemic, the toll it's taken both economically and, and health wise and, and, and people obviously dying. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's been awful, but the, the one sort of thing that has actually come out of it is the longer the pandemic has gone on, I would actually think that our conviction as officers of thesis has actually um, come right back. And if anything, I think has, has sort of uh, come back with resolve. Um, I think one of the things we, we've sort of tried to take a look at a few different things. We've sort of tried to take a look at sort of what might that mean for the office going forward. We've tried to take a look at sort of commodity versus differentiated. We've tried to sort of reimagine what our flex solutions might be. Uh, obviously, there's going to be an increased solution, uh, increased focus on health and safety and wellness. And I think the other thing that we're really sort of trying to focus on is just trying to make it more customer centric. And I'll talk more about that later, but really removing the friction from the experience. So you touched on briefly, Chuck, and I would say I agree with you that the consensus seems to be building around an agile hybrid, but what exactly does that mean? And I think questions remain. I think expecting the office to be the same as before is probably a fallacy. I think it's unrealistic to expect that everyone's gonna come in every day and sit on eight, 10, 12 hours a day of Zoom calls when they can do that at home. The office is gonna to have to be, and I think to, to Mike's point and Mike's quote, which I think was fantastic, is you've got to create an environment that people are going to miss when they're not there. And I think, you know, as time has worn on, we are definitely missing certain elements of the office. But I think it's, it's, it's giving us an opportunity to sort of reimagine what that office might be going forward. I mean, you can't just provide somebody a desk and a chair and expect that they're going to show up every day. Um, you know, one of the things I think we've learned from the pandemic is, you know, having these sort of calls on Zoom, I mean, it works because everybody's in the same boat. It's, it's a big leveler. But when you get into a hybrid model and some people are at home and some people are at work, um, how, how's exactly that going to work? Um, and um, I think we've also learned that some tasks are quite hard to do remotely, such as sort of mentoring and training, collaboration and, you know, sort of uh, corporate culture, immersion of that, and attraction and retention of talent. And I think as the, um, the lockdown sort of starts to, um, you know, come off and more and more people do re-enter the workforce, um, there was a great article in Bloomberg this morning about this sort of fear of missing out. And I think that's, that, that's a real um, factor that I think we're going to need to consider going forward. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think... Um, I, I, th I think the other thing, too, that I, I just want to touch on quickly is I think we are grossly underestimating the mental health toll that the working from home piece um, has uh, has caused people. Um, and, um, you know, I think that uh, requires, uh, you know, a lot more thought. And um, I'll leave it at that for now. But Chuck, I would say in summary, I, I would agree with your thesis. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I mean, great, great points. I couple of things that really resonated with me on 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 your remarks you know there are a lot of questions out there still right and, and, and there's some open open questions around how will that office be used and 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 the hybrid and and it's it's one thing is for sure it's not going to be the same as it was uh in in, in terms of of its use pattern and i couldn't agree with you more uh on the human element of this and the mental health element of this uh, I think that's something that that we're going to be uh, forever reflecting on, forever dealing with, uh, and hopefully able to get better from. So, but so thank you, Gr great comments, Sally Akino, uh Maybe share your macro views with us, and then we'll round out with uh, with Craig. Sure. Um, there's not a lot to add after Jonathan and Michael's comments. I do agree with your thesis, but there was a line that I read last week in one of our Canadian national newspapers, and I'll just quote it. So people are tired of living at work. And I thought that that encapsulated the general mood and consensus of what the prospects, which are positive in my view, are for office on a go forwards basis. Now, uh, Cadillac Fairview um, has, I guess, a bit of a unique perch in Canada in that, you know, we are a very large uh, office owner and operator 
uh, in our central business districts across four major cities in Canada. And primarily the biggest portfolio is being situated in Toronto and in Vancouver. We have a lot of very large clients and we have basically, you know, the corporate who's who of Canadian business, including all the major law firms and all the major financial institutions, which also rank globally. In all of our discussions with all of our major clients, the simple truth of the matter is that there isn't a lot of certainty with regards to what they're going to need in terms of office space post pandemic. And I think that's smart. And I think it's smart because everybody's just, look, let's wait. Let's wait to see what our employees tell us when most of them do start coming back to work, what their living arrangements are going to be like, what education arrangements are going to be like, how many have moved away from the city center to a suburban location during COVID that makes commuting more difficult? What are our needs actually going to be going forwards? What is the rate of growth of our business? Um, we also have the unique advantage in, a, in those two markets that I mentioned where we started with a very low vacancy, vacancy rate, you know, below 2%. So there is some latitude for some changes, but the industry overall is going to be, you know, in very good shape to deal with, you know, providing flexibility to a, a lot of our clients for those who decide that they need it. You know, one last thought, um, I also have um, a unique perspective in that I also operate um, uh, you know, a large portfolio of shopping centers in, in the country. I could tell you that the rate of collection for office since the beginning of COVID has been way, way, way higher, almost exactly the same as pre-COVID in our portfolio as compared to my retail collection rate, which I won't say out publicly. What that indicates to me is that there isn't the same existential questioning of the fundamental use and business of office on a go forwards basis as there are in parts of the retail world. So that also gives me a high level of confidence about, okay, what does the future look like for office? There's gonna be some tweaking, no doubt, you know, as per Michael and Jonathan's comments, but parts of it aren't going away, which is really encouraging um, for us as office owners and developers. Yeah, Sal, great, great points. And, and I, I, I like that quote that you said that you saw, you're tired of living at work. And that speaks a little bit to, uh, to that, that chart I showed the KPMG uh, survey uh, of CEOs. And I think a lot, of, a lot of employees are just feeling challenged with that boundary merge right that's happened and uh and so i think that that's a very good point craig let, let's maybe round out some macro per perspectives from you and uh we're delighted to have you here on the panel today again from a technology point of view and 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 a little bit of a disruptive point of view so so keen to hear your uh macro uh point of view and 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 comments over to you thanks so much chuck so I'm going to take a macro. First of all, I agree with everything I've heard the other panelists say, and I, I agree with the uh, perspective that you shared in your uh, opening remarks. Uh, I had an opportunity to dig into a book by uh, a Harvard economist named Edward Glazer. And what he had in his team did is they went back and they looked at what happened through all of the other pandemics that we've experienced on earth for what they could get history on. And their perspective is that history will repeat itself this time. Every other pandemic went through a situation where the cities were the locus of infection and death. Everybody who could would move out of the city and, and then all the economists and everyone else, the business leaders would go, wow, the cities are dead. And guess what? In every single example, they can demonstrate that within a very short period of time after the pandemic no longer being a threat, cities no, not only came back to life, but they grew to a new, more exciting level. And they were reimagined because people come back with new ideas and things need to change. There's demand for change. 
So I think, you know, if, if we believe that history will repeat itself and that this thesis is correct, we should expect cities to roar back to life. You know, there's just such pent up demand. You know, human beings are social by their nature and they love cities. They will love what they get living in a city, working in a city. So I, I fully expect, I don't know how long this will take, but I fully expect that we'll see the pendulum swing back. Cities will become very vibrant. I think they will change. And I think it's, you know, that, that's why it's so, so right for us to be having this discussion today about how do we need to reimagine the workspace, which is such an important part of living and uh, working in a city. Yeah, great, great comments, Craig. And, and uh, I think that's, that's an interesting, an interesting theory, an interesting concept. I completely agree with that. I too think that that pendulum is going to swing back. And, and the open question, of course, is when, but, but so I think a theme that sort of goes through all of this and, and, and maybe it started right off with, with Michael Emery talking about this visibility increase. And I think just in general, as there's a visibility increase, a confidence increase, a, a, a human comfort increase, we're going to see a lot of things change back. So, so thank you all for your opening perspective. I, I, I think that's great. Let's dive in now to those sort of three impact areas that, that I talked about. And, and, and I, I want to start off with investment philosophy. And the great thing about uh, all of you, this group of panelists, is you're not afraid to share uh, how you feel. Uh, and, and, and so I'm looking forward to some real uh, exciting dialogue around this. I want to start first, and, and maybe uh, Jonathan Pierce and Michael Emery, I'll start with you two on this one, uh, around investment philosophy. So, uh, and, and please, other panelists, chime in, right, uh, after, after this. Let, let's get some real good dialogue here. Um, as an investor, has this disruption, or is this disruption, impacting your investment thesis, right? Um, have new opportunity zones emerged? Um, is there a geographic shift? Is there an urban suburban story here? Uh, you know, is there an asset repositioning story here? So as an owner and, and, and Michael, maybe you go first and then, and then Jonathan will come in. What's changed if anything? Well, it's, it's a good question for us to start with. As you know, Chuck, Allied has been a public entity for about 19 years now. And our entire business is based on and a product of urban intensification. So we really started uh, prior to going public, intensifying the urban core for office use. And that secular trend has propelled our business for almost two decades now. And Canadian cities, by and large, have been going through a period of truly transformational intensification over the last two decades. That applies certainly to Toronto, but it's equally applicable to Montreal. And Vancouver, of course, um, is also going through a transformation now from a secondary to a primary office market. So urban intensification is where it's been. My belief is urban intensification is where it's going. And we're in a historic transformative era in Canadian cities. Calgary too has a future. It's currently in a period of decline or disruption, but it too uh, will continue to intensify over time. And I think the tech advertising and media, media sector will help propel it back to viability. So, with respect to our investment thesis, it remains completely grounded in urban intensification. We have no interest in suburban office space. That's not to say it's not a good investment, uh, but it has nothing to do with what we do. Everything we do is grounded in urban intensification. And my belief is 
ultimately the pandemic will propel or accelerate urban intensification, not reverse it. And I think Craig's observations with respect to Edward Glazer's study are entirely supportive of that expectation. So our investment thesis remains unchanged in its fundamental elements. In terms of the attributes we'll look for or strive to create in office space, they'll continue to evolve as they have been for decades now. And there will be emphasis on sustainability and wellness, but that's another subject. So I'll shut up and let Jonathan uh, take over from here. Great, great comments, Michael. And, and it, first of all, I applaud you on your conviction, right? And, and that's what I'm hearing. No, but that's what I'm hearing is, is that, is that, you know, your investment thesis is completely grounded in urban intensification. And this disruption, while in the moment, may have some macro touches, that long term, it's not, if anything, it's going to accelerate and support your, your thesis. So thank you for that. Jonathan, your point of view. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think M Michael's got great points. Um, you know, I'll try and put our spin on it. Um, you know, I mean, I think everyone's heard of sort of follow the money. Uh, we've sort of been looking at sort of following the people. Um, I think, you know, we, we've been spending quite a lot of time trying to obviously, you know, have some humility in the exercise, but really, um, you know, looking at migration of talent. I mean, obviously the pandemic seen a lot of people move around. And, and I think it's really important to ask, well, what's driving that? Like, is it, is it quality of life? Is it fear? Is it cost of living? Is it access to educational institutions? Is it healthcare? Um, and is it temporary or permanent? Um, you know, I think the other thing that's really important to ask is, why do large companies, why does a Google or an Amazon build a very large hub in New York City? Is it, is it to get closer to its customer? No, it's to skim talent, right? And, you know, why do people choose to live in cities? Well, I think, you know, the answers, you know, that sort of, I believe, are, you know, to access culture, to access restaurants, uh, you know, the social piece, potentially to meet a significant other, because it's exciting. Um, there's been a lot of prognostications during this pandemic that are based on the now and people are taking the now and saying this is how it's going to be for here on in. And I fundamentally believe with conviction that that's incorrect. I think cities are resilient and we as humans are resilient. I mean, 9-11 was, you know, a horrific event, but a great example. No one was going to work in tall office buildings and no one was going to fly again. And, you know, sure enough, you know, um, both of those things sort of proved to be wrong. Um, so from Ivanhoe's perspective, I would say, you know, I wouldn't bet against key gateway cities, whether that's in Canada or the US or, or beyond. Um, we don't believe that the Torontos or the Vancouver's or the New York's are going, you know, to be a, a you know, th there's gonna be, they're not gonna go away as a key choice for people to live. I mean, there's also been a number of fairly large big tech lease signings over the last six months too. And it's funny, you brought up that KPMG study. I was reading that and I was gonna raise it myself, but I mean, you know, there's a big shift in sentiments. And I sort of mentioned it in my opening remarks that two or three months in, we were a little worried, but I think the longer this has gone on, it, it's resolved our convictions. In terms of what we like, um, you know, I mean, I think we have, evolved a little bit. Um, it's definitely urban versus suburban. There was a lot of commentary early on in the pandemic that all the companies were going to leave the cities and they were going to move out to the burbs and all this sort of stuff. And we were tracking that very closely and speaking with our, you know, brokerage partners. And sure, there were a lot of tenants who were out touring the suburbs, but they were kicking tires. Um, almost none of them pulled the trigger. Um, there were next to no major big suburban lease signings in major, you know, North American metros um, that were sort of reversed migration. In fact, cities like Chicago and, and others have actually just recently announced inward migration in the last two or three weeks from additional suburban companies sort of tending to support what Mike and, and what you said, Chuck. So, you know, I mean, uh, th there's a lot of there's a lot of agreement here, and I think consensus amongst the panelists. We've all got our different spin, um, but yeah, I, I we have high conviction in office as an asset class. I do, but I will reiterate my earlier points. 
that I think differentiated office is what we have high conviction in. Commodity office is what we don't. Um, but uh, urban differentiated office, we definitely have high conviction. Uh, some of the markets that we're looking at in, a, in addition to the big gateway, we're, we're, we're actually quite interested in the Sun Belt right now. Um, but, um, you know, we, um, you know, I, I would definitely stand with what uh, Michael and what Craig has said. I, I wanted to pick up on something, Jonathan, that you said, you know, follow the people. And I just want to, I want to bounce this back to, to the panel. Um, you know, we're talking about the office and how it will, you know, it is, it is being reimagined and it's purpose and place in the workplace ecosystem is going to be sort of rethought. Do you think, you know, you talk about urban versus suburban, but do you think that there are companies that are going to be doing the same thing with their actual physical buildings? Are they going to be looking at their portfolios and saying, hey, we want to actually see, we, we want to hub and spoke. So does the downtown facility represent something different and we now do want a suburban facility so i mean do, do you think that that portfolio thinking evolves in any way are you asking me i'm asking you or michael or no, Sal. I, I mean I'll, I'll give my response to that very very quickly i mean i think to an extent i think it's less about sort of it, i think it's more about work from anywhere and the ability to work sort of flexibly um, you know, I mean, I look at people on my team, I've got people who live in four and 500 square foot condos with a significant other and working from home is just, you know, to quote uh, David Solomon has been an aberration for them, right? So, I mean, you know, um, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's not a one size fits all. It doesn't, you know, work for everyone. Some people have had a great experience with it and we need to definitely as both employers and landlords recognize that. And again, create an environment that people are going to miss when they're not there. Um, I, I think giving people choice, again, it goes back to the comment of desk and chair, is if you have a different sort of thoughtful, different environments, different sort of types of rooms and spaces that people can leverage, I think the return to the office and the durability of the office and the engagement of the office will be higher than if it looks exactly like, you know, it did in the 1970s. So um, I, I don't necessarily see big suburban hubs. Um, I do see potentially companies, you know, augmenting a hub structure with, you know, an element of flex uh, or an element of, you know, um, having uh, being allowing their employees to sort of work at client sites as well. Yeah. Um, but interested to hear what my fellow panelists say. No, I, I agree, Jonathan. But what I was going to add, though, is you know we can't. Um, we can't put forward the thesis or our thoughts on what we think may happen in that regard without also just highlighting specific existing guardrails that will inevitably funnel what the um, range of choices and options that people have of where they can live. And then based on that, will drive an employer's plans to accommodate those people based on you know, where they live. So for example, I mean, development controls in all the major cities in Canada are for suburban, for continued suburban development are awful. They're really difficult to navigate. They are incredibly long. Even just to build a building in an existing intensified site is difficult enough but to extend out suburban developments is becoming almost impossible. So I think, you know, the idea for a lot of people is I'd love to go live in the suburbs somewhere, but that may not necessarily be an option that's available or certainly a low cost option that's available. It may not be an option that affords or provides schooling or medical services or entertainment and so on. So. I don't think we could take this out of context. We have to provide, you know, the totality of the different things that we need to think about as a society that, to Michael's point, will inevitably drive people back to where the action already is because it's paid for, because it's easier. And all of that is going to be done in the context of COVID and the rear view mirror a year or two or three from now when people are just feeling more comfortable about life and not having that level of anxiety about 
a risk to their health. Yeah. yeah. Chuck, just to pick up on what Sal said, our experience is the number one differentiator for office space is location within amenity rich urban environments. What people are really after is a neighborhood amenity package that allows them more or less to enjoy everything they can enjoy in a city. And no building in itself, in and of itself, is big enough to afford that. So I think that militates ultimately against the hub and spoke notion. I can't prove that and, and only time and human behavior will prove that, but I'm inclined to agree with Sal for the reason he mentioned and also for, for the, the incredible attraction that amenity rich urban environments represent to office users, yeah. both employers and employees. The other thing that I would add is Creativity is the driving force and talent competition is the driving force for employers. They will go where the talent is. So I do agree, if the talent moves to the suburbs, the employers are going there, no doubt about it. Hence follow the people. Follow the people. Totally agree, Jonathan. So it's all about talent. Nobody loves Toronto per se, although it is a great city to live in, but the employers love the concentration of talent. Montreal is a very interesting example in Canada. Montreal has five major institutions of higher learning and they're all excellent. And they're educating 250,000 young men and women every year. People aren't going there because they love Montreal, although there is a lot to love about Montreal. They're going there because of those talented young men and women who can help them achieve their corporate objectives. Full stop, Google has expanded there. Happily, they opened in an allied building. Um, and Jonathan's got a number of experiences where major tech firms are expanding within the Ivanhoe Cambridge portfolio. It's all about talent. And yeah. so where the talent goes, the employers go. And where the employers go, the office goes. My bet is for all the reasons we've collectively recited as a panel, my bet is they ain't going out of the inner city in yeah. any meaningful way. I think that's a good point. That's actually a good segue into, I, I like your comment about amenity rich neighborhoods and, and locating building. I think that's a good segue into, into our second impact area. Um, and, and, and maybe Sal and Craig will have you as the primary voices on this. And then again, have the panel come in just like we did. You know, let's talk a little bit about, um, about the future. What is this going to do? What is this pandemic? What is this re reimagining of the office going to do an impact on how buildings are built uh, and how they're designed and 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 what is that lens towards the amenity construct in the building uh, and 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 is that changing at all to size and scale uh, do you think differently about size and scale and and then Craig of course from a technology point of view you know how is that going to disrupt and innovate when we're building buildings so Sal maybe we'll start with you and go to Craig yeah, uh, look, we, we've been in a, an incredibly unique situation where we've had a front row seat to a wide range of views on this. And as developers, we've actually been able to accommodate that wide ranging set of views and needs. So for example, um, we converted a former Sears department store box in downtown Vancouver that had large floor plate sizes of around call it 70,000 square feet, oh, excuse me, 100,000 square feet. And we punched an atrium through it. And we weren't sure whether there would be a market for very large floor plate size office space. And we were incredibly successful in leasing it out, primarily to tech tenants, including 
Microsoft, um, et cetera. So that proved to us that that scale of floor plate, you know, from a very um, nuts and bolts perspective worked for, you know, in that market. And subsequently there have been other projects like that where in the past we would have like potentially not gone ahead with an office floor plate size of that scale and stuck with the standard 20 to 30,000 square foot floor plate in an office building. Fast forward, we started uh, two new developments in downtown Toronto, where they are the more, you know, call them standard floor plate sizes of around 30,000 square feet at 16 New York and at uh, 160 front. Um, and both leased up very well. Uh, one uh, is close to 90%, the other one's 100% leased, and one is still under construction. So there's still a market for, call it your standard office plate. But we also converted another uh, former Sears box in the Toronto Eaton Center, which has currently three office buildings attached to it, uh, totaling over 2 million square feet of space. But we converted this box and marketed it for office use. And the floor plates are around 70,000 square feet. And the entirety of that box uh, on the office uh, levels was leased to uh, a Canadian financial institution who I believe for the first time in its history it has adopted large floor plate type of configuration and occupancy uh, totaling around 350,000 square feet in total in order to be able to um, design and occupy space for its younger employees um, in the same fashion as a tech as a tech company would. So it's it's we've been able to deal with the wide range of these different views and needs. And um, I don't think it's a one size uh, fits all yeah. strategy for sure. But uh, we've experienced both, and we're we've been incredibly happy to be able to accommodate both views. Yeah, Craig from a from a, a technology point of view, and we, you know, we've heard some of the panelists talk about, about the real expansion and drive of tech tenancies and things like that, but, but just digital disruption in general and, and technology in general, what's the view from your seat on, on impact and how that relates to, to office and, 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 to, and to buildings? Sure. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is pick up on a comment that Michael made around, you know, companies really are in a situation where they're all about attracting the right talent. So as if you step back and look at this from the user experience or from the people who are actually the employees of the companies using these space, I think one of the things the pandemic will have done is change their needs and their expectations of their employers in terms of what am I being offered in terms of safety? Can I confidently return? Is the workspace a productive one where I enjoy being? You know, I think if we look south of the mark or south of the border into the, the tech valley in uh, California, a lot of the innovation that's happened in office design has come from the need to create different amenities, different work experiences, higher productivity. And that's driven a complete different a change to, you know, this agile process of how people work. And um, to pick up on what, what Sal just said, I, I've worked in the, in the financial sector for the last 20 years, huge movement towards agile. They are all looking to adopt the similar work practices used by the tech firms and they're demanding changes to the workspace so that it's more open, they can move to agile. So I think, I think the, the builders need to consider what are the users going to be demanding and are they going to be more discerning in terms of who they go work for? In which case the employers are going to have to create workspaces and environments that are more suitable to the needs of today's people. Now, from a technology standpoint, um, we, we, we believe that we're on the verge of a renaissance. Like all the technology exists today to completely change people's experience within the work space that they're in or their living space. 
And certainly we're seeing some of that go into the new built space. There's you know, some very high tech buildings being built right now, but the cost of retrofitting some of the older built space has come down so dramatically that it's, it's no longer prohibitive. You can make small investments, pay them out very quickly and dramatically change the experience that people are gonna have when they come to work. So I really, I, I think Renaissance is the right way to, uh, to look at it. The technology has evolved so far and the costs have come down so much that uh, I think having, having employees and employers demanding change and different experiences can be accommodated uh, through today's technology. And, and the, the stuff I see coming in the future is, uh, is spectacular. So there, I think there will be demand for change and we're uh, in a good place to, uh, to make that change happen. And Craig, I like your comment about the, the, the risk, really I'm inferring the responsibility that is going to come to people that run businesses uh, and to the employer uh, about creating that place that people can return. And I, I see a question that's come in on the chat room that will address it, that, that, that's drilling into that. So I'll, I'll save that for the panelists to, to come back at, at Q and A. Um, so, so great comments. I, just time check here. Uh, I think we're, we're doing well. I, I don't want to leave this topic just quite yet and might just bounce back to the panelists here on, on actual amenities in the building, in the building itself. So how do we see that? How do we see that evolving? Is there an impact zone here around that? What are you thinking? Maybe Jonathan, start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. I mean, definitely in North America, there's been, you know, this amenities arms race that's been going on for sort of years. Um, but I think, again, it's sort of commodity versus non-commodity. But I think we need to sort of learn from the pandemic, too. Like, I mean, you know, we as landlords try to outdo each other with these fitness facilities that were tenant only that, you know, when originally, I mean, 10 years ago, you know, a room in a basement with a few weights, uh, you know, it checked the box of the office gym and that was deemed to be okay. And the sort of more recent pre-pandemic offerings are almost Equinox quality. Um, but I think we need to do the gut check about what have we learned? I mean, obviously, um, you know, I mean, I, I look at, you know, my own family's consumption of fitness and, you know, I mean, online is definitely um, picked up. I mean, I think a lot of us now have equipment at home because of the pandemic. It hasn't been as easy to access physical uh, spaces. Um, online classes, they seem to be having uh, a greater uh, acceptance. So our office gyms, our fitness facilities going forward need going to need to be the same, right? Are, are they going to need to be um, you know, um, the same as what they have been. So I think we need to sort of answer that question. And then I think the other piece as well that we spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, food and beverage in office buildings, you know, I mean, it's been a disaster. It's been disappointing. It's been antiquated. I mean, you go to most Canadian urban, um, you know, and I would say big corporate office buildings, le less so creative, um, where it's more sort of street front. Um, and it's just been fast food chains in a windowless room with furniture screwed to the floor. I mean, it's just been, you know, so badly done. And I think we're really sort of needing to sort of shift. And it was definitely happening pre-COVID into sort of curated offerings, different offerings, local champions, almost a push back against fast food and chains and healthier and nutrition and it, how that all sort of ties in. And also how you use the space as well. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be that third place. It doesn't just need to be a place that a swarm of people descend at 1145 and clear out at two. It needs to be that sort of all day. It needs to have that all day economy, whether that's coffee, whether that's impromptu meetings. And again, it's how do we leverage that office experience? And we're looking at putting that into, you know, a number of our developments that are sort of under construction now, but it's leveraging those third places and giving people choice so that yeah. they can physically get up from their desk um, and, you know, have different kinds of rooms, outdoor space, uh, food and beverage outdoors, um, rotating food and beverage rather than signing long-term leases and saying, 
you're going to get this uh, burger guy for the next 15 years. It's actually, we put in the infrastructure and you almost rotate them out, almost like rotating food trucks. Um, so I do think the amenities thing is, is, is a journey and we're, you know, we're, we're sort of partly along the continuum. So I love that. Michael, Sal, anything to add from your seat around Which, this issue? I'd add one thing, conscious of the fact that I use the word amenity first, or I may well have, I think it's actually far too trite a word to describe what we're all trying to achieve. I think culture is probably a better word. And I think we need to create something that is as deep, as rich, as complex, and as difficult to define as a cultural environment for users of office space. Um, and, you know, we found, we had a great experience in Montreal where we were redeveloping a building that might displace a whole bunch of artists. So rather than, um, if you will, operate at odds with the community, we made a long-term home for the artists in the building. The interesting thing about that was, the very fact that we did that attracted other creative tenants because they didn't want the responsibility for displacing the artists. And once we had made a home for them, um, they were actually more attracted to the building. And then of course, in the common areas, there was certainly an arts theme that evolved. So I think amenity is, as I say, too trite a word. It, it sort of implies dry cleaner and drugstore and that's not what anyone's after. They, they're they necessary, uh, but they're not sufficient. And in fact, you know, we've, we've tended to try not to <laughs> house dry cleaners and, and, and grocery stores and drug stores, not because we're snobbish or elitist in any way, but it's not the culture that people are looking for. And hopefully someone else in the neighborhood provides that so I think it's it's really more aptly thought about and and will be thought about uh, more meaningfully as culture going forward. I, I think I hope so. Yeah. I, I would add to Jonathan and Michael's uh, list. Um, I think something that's very important that's going to be part of the industry is five G, and I think you know just providing that and that that you know, likely will become table stakes very quickly, but the quality of broadband and Wi-Fi um, in our office buildings um, is going to be, you know, a very important aspect of any tenant's occupancy that will also, depending on their own specific technologies that they use and adopt, will be an enabler for them to become more successful, more productive, and more satisfied customers of ours. So I, th you know, and that's going to necessitate some, you know, some amount of investment from uh, our industry on a go forwards basis. The other aspect that I would add to, which I think is, um, was something that was bubbling up, but certainly um, a, a firmer lesson post COVID is as an office owner and operator, to likely in the future provide also some flex space operated by ourselves. Um, that would also be, I call, I, I, I consider that to be an amenity, um, but it certainly does a lot of different things for our clients and would set us well in order to ensure that, you know, they remain confident um, in their continued occupancy. Um, on longer term leases where they know that they have the ability to be able to turn on and off some amount of space on flexible terms within the same building to accommodate the same team members without having to step out of spaces that have created the culture that they want to um, provide to their employees. Sal, I think that's a, that's a great comment and actually a great segue into what I think our final, maybe our, our final impact zone here is, and, and that is, you know, what, uh, what has this disruption done uh, 
if anything, to change the way that you as owners and investors see the tenant relationship from a lease point of view. And, and you know, we're talking about you know, lease terms and, and, and things like that. Maybe Jonathan and Michael will have you as the primaries and then have the panels go in. Um, you know, we talk about tenant experience right inside the, in the building, but has this prompted anything from where you sit uh, that might need to be changed in a lease structure? Um, do you feel differently about covenant uh, or inducement packages and, and things like that? And, and certainly are there innovation opportunities here in the way, you know, you organize around your tenants, you know, contractually? Jonathan, maybe start with you. Sure. Um, okay. Thank you. So yeah, I, I, look, I, I think that's a great question. And I think the simple answer is um, getting closer to our tenants um, and, and, and viewing them as partners uh, and having deep relationships of trust, um, I, I think is, is, is really, you know, what we need to sort of focus on as, as, as the landlord community. I mean, even the word tenant is wrong. I mean, it sort of originates from the feudal days and the connotations are awful. Um, you know, they are our customers. They are, you know, they're our guests. Um, and, you know, we need to start treating them as such. And I think one of the things that we've learned, um, and I wouldn't just say it applies to us, I think it applies to probably landlords globally, is um, I think we made a fundamental error and picking up on Sal's comments on Flex, um, landlords made a fundamental mistake ceding control of enterprise tenant relationships to a third party with the Flex operators. Um, you know, co-working and enterprise Flex did a lot of things really well, right? They, they, they proved a new business model. They demonstrated a need for agility in shorter lease terms. Um, even though the economic model was misaligned and taking sort of short-term revenue streams with long-term lease obligations, we know the rest of the story. But I mean, you know, quite frankly, you know, the landlords sort of ended up wearing this. Um, and I think one thing that we've learned sort of out of this is at the end of the day, we need to have those deep relationships with our tenants directly. Um, and... Um, you know, we need to provide them with flexible solutions. I mean, I still think there's very much a role, certainly on the Ivanhoe Cambridge side is, you know, we're not, we don't necessarily view that we're the best person to operate uh, a flexible strategy for ourselves. But I think it is an operator uh, type model where the intelligence and the lease up um, and the control res uh, re resides with us rather than sort of just, you know, passing it off to a third party. Um, so I think that's really important in terms of sort of tenants relationship and not sort of on the experience side, we've talked a bit obviously about um, amenitization and third spaces and obviously tenant engagement apps are huge right now uh, and diverse food and beverage um, uh, offerings. But I think also how companies access space um, you know, one of the things we like about controlling flex on a white label basis, and it kind of touches on what Sal just said, is I can lease 20 or 30,000 square feet for a tenant as a hub on a longer term basis. And on the same contract, I can give them that 20% flex, whether it's space on demand or an additional 5,000 feet for six months. And it's all done the same way. You don't have to say to your tenant, well, I'll give you the 20 and you go down the hall and lease the flex piece from somebody else. So I think that's really important. So, I mean, you know, we, we've sort of learned from that. And the other thing that we're watching very, very carefully is, you know, the, the use of technology. I mean, obviously, you know, we just made a fairly strategic investment in Fifth Wall. I mean, obviously, PropTech is massive. There's so many great concepts out there. Um, you know, some are going to take, some are not. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing is sort of like the unpacking of, you know, uh, a building OS. And it will be very interesting to sort of see is, are we going to get to a point where a cohesive building OS, you know, comes forward that sort of almost is the holy grail? Because most of these prop tech offerings, you know, they solve a problem, but they don't solve all the problems. So are we going to get to sort of like a building OS ecosystem? And I sort of see that, you know, maybe being more from 
you know, sort of a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google rather than say a Honeywell or a Yachty or, you know, someone like that. So um, I, I sort of view that as, um, you know, something that we need to sort of keep watching. And in terms of being able to provide a seamless offering to our tenants. And then the last thing, you know, I just want to touch on too is, I, you know, the access to space is how, how, why, why should a tenant, why should they need to sign an 80 page lease? Why does it need to be a protracted process? I think one of the brokerage firms early on, um, and it, they were promoting WeWork and they had a, a guy in a suit saying, I could lease this space and, you know, do this, sign an 80 page lease in 12 months, I'm in my space. And the other one was, I, I can sign a three page license agreement and I can be in my space tomorrow. And I think, you know, why can we rent a, you know, a house in Tuscany at three o'clock in the morning, sat on a couch, but we can't do the same for our space. So I do sort of see that element of disruption and access becoming even more important, that we need to make it easier, uh, that we need to sort of question the process and shrink it. That doesn't mean that there isn't a need for strategic advice. There absolutely is. And I think there always will be. But, you know, I, I think how people transact and how those transactions get done, um, you know, when we start sort of thinking about tenant relationships, we need to make it easier on, on these people because quite frankly, otherwise somebody else will and they'll go there. So we need to be the path of least resistance. So yeah, I, I, I want to, I think that's a great point. And I want to, I want to keep on that and, and maybe pass that over to Sal and Michael for a second. But I also like your point about building operating systems and where that's going and evolution and whatnot. Craig, do you have a, uh, you know, what's the view from your seat there? So uh, I, I really agree with what uh, Jonathan's saying. And, you know, a number of the solutions that are out there in PropTech right now really are point solutions. And I think as a, as a builder, looking at all these different guys walking through the door and trying to say, how do we integrate all this and make sense of it? Every one of them probably makes sense on its own, but stepping back and looking at it, where is the operating system? And I'd like to throw out that uh, the solution we have at ThoughtWire is probably more like the operating system than an individual point solution, because what it does is integrate all of those other solutions together and give a view of the, tota the total. So, um, Jonathan, I'm just going to do a sales pitch that I think we may have an operating system you're looking. So I, I should add ThoughtWire to Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Exactly. <laughs> now, after we acquire Google, you can go with us. We'll, 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 we'll connect offline. <laughs> Chuck, I would add that um, no doubt that I think uh, blockchain technology will present certain opportunities to really streamline, you know, the entirety of the commercial real estate leasing process because it's a question of establishing trust. The reason why there's so many turnarounds on a lease document is because everybody wants to make sure that nothing's been changed since the last one. So um, there's certainly an easier way of doing that and technology will be able to provide that platform. And to come to your question in terms of, you know, uh, how we could establish more flexible office leasing um, terms generally, Again, we have guardrails in our business. And I think, you know, there aren't any exceptions in the world. Let's talk to the appraisal community. Let's talk to the investment world. And, you know, how does, and let's talk to the lending community. Like, how does anybody feel comfortable about lease, about lending on a new development if all the terms are incredibly flexible or maybe have one year terms on a million square foot building? Currently impossible and potentially impossible going forward. but. You know, we, we would have to um, have a sea change in how we view the valuation of real estate uh, and the stability of, you know, uh, operating income, even under very flexible uh, terms. And um, I don't think we're anywhere close to that today. Yeah. Uh, Michael, maybe your view and then and JP will go back to you. Sure. Well, Jonathan and I agree on a lot of things. I don't think we fully agree on the significance of co-working or whatever you want to call that. Um, I think there's two things about co-working that are interesting to us today. And it has, in my view, failed conspicuously. But, but there are two very interesting and informative things about it. First of all, um, co-working exploded as it did because there was a need for flexibility 
And more importantly, because most people didn't want to work from home. They wanted to be present with other people, even people they didn't know or didn't have a relationship with. So that's always interested me. The second thing about co-working that interests me, it was pre-pandemic, the great disruptor of the office world. It didn't disrupt a goddamn thing, excuse my language, it disrupted itself. Um, there was no impact on what we do or the way we deal with tenants uh, by virtue of co-working. We did accommodate a few co-working enterprises in our buildings, happily. Uh, we weren't overly exposed to them. And, and I think we selected well because we worked with IPW and they have performed right through the pandemic without, uh, without interruption whatsoever. So I don't know uh, that the need for flexibility um, is quite as disruptive as we thought it was. And I also think the industry has the ability to cope with the need. We, for example, will readily enter into short-term lease deals with tenants who are migrating into developments that we're going to complete a year, two or three down the road. So we will afford that flexibility. It's in our interest to do so. Um, and we have found time and time again, users are prepared to look upon us as their space partners. And we want them to look upon us that way. If they have a problem, we will find the solution for them, even if it's interim, even if it's contraction, even if it's expansion. So I think the underlying reality of all this and this question is the relationship between user and owner has become a collaborative one, not a feudal one as, as Jonathan rightly points out, the old language implies and indeed the old law implies. Um, it's really collaboration. And so in the context of collaboration, I think you have to be able to provide more flexibility so that someone looks upon you as their space partner across the country. That's our goal. I'm not saying we've done a perfect job, but that's our goal. So we provide flexibility in the context of ongoing collaboration with enterprises that use our space. But just to be flexible as an offering, I'm gonna give a kid a two month lease, not interesting to me, but very happy to have other people do that in our buildings to a limited extent. Right. I'm sure not gonna do the kind of deals we work wanted to do back in the day. Right. Interesting. Jonathan, did you wanna make a final comment before we move on from this one? Yeah, yeah no, one clarifying. I mean, less of, my comments were less about co-working and more about enterprise grade flex, Mike. Um, you know, um, and, and then, I think Sal's comment on value and finance uh, is extremely important. And I just wanted to sort of come back to that for one second and just sort of point out, I think the education of the, the debt markets, the appraisers is absolutely critical. And I've sort of been beating this drum for a few years now is, you know, I mean, other asset classes, I mean, you know, you look at hotels, they typically have nightly or, you know, few nightly uh, occupancy contracts and residential might have monthly or annual contracts. So, so why does an office, you know, need to have long-term cap cash flow priced amongst all else? I mean, I think if the offering is there and the reason the other two asset classes have managed to do that is they've been able to successfully demonstrate the depth of the market. And I think we as office owners, is it's kind of on us to sort of say there is that depth and there is that resiliency and there is this need for shorter term and flexible leases. And I think ultimately it's going to be sort of a wave of change that, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think, you know, it will happen. So that, that was what I wanted to add. Great. Thank you. No, I think that's good. Great comments. And, and maybe Jonathan will, will stay with you because I want to, just before we get into questions, the time check, we've got about 15 minutes left and, and I see we've got five or six questions in the, in the chat room and I, and I want to get to those. Um, 
but that's just great dialogue around those three impact zones that we had about investment thesis uh, and an impact there. Um, the thinking of how buildings will be built and designed and, and, and the impact there. And then, and then finally, this relationship with the user, with the customer. Completely agree with, with the from to in terms of tenant to collaborative customer and user. Um, great to unpack those three. I want to do a, just a real quick rapid fire here with, with each of you. And Jonathan, we'll start with you and we'll go around the horn. If you could sum up sort of as, as we look here, the future, and a time will tell. Um, but if you could sum up into one word or one sentence to leave the audience with here in the future of office, what would it be? Jonathan, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a great question um, to answer it quickly. I mean, I, I think w whichever way you come from it, it needs to focus on the value creator. And the value creator isn't us. It's the end user. It's the tenant. It's the partner. It's the guest. It's the customer. So I think all roads point back to that. Thank you. Great, great, great point. Michael? Well, I'm going to steal Craig's word. Uh, renaissance. Yeah. Craig, you better hurry up and come, come into your right after Sal. You need to think of another word. Sal, how would you sum it up? Back to the future. Back to the future. Back to the future. Love it. Uh, Craig, you can have the last word. If you can sum it up for everybody in the audience here, the future of office, what would you say? So I think I, I, I want to double down on what Jonathan said. I think the focus on the end user is absolutely what we have to do. Um, building on some of the amenity discussion, I'm going to use the term ESG as my environmental, social, and governance. I mean, that, that's been a framework that's been around for some time. But if we think of the end user as being who needs to be attracted back into office space, focusing on ESG principles, environmental. I see some questions in here like, how important is environmental? given the climate crisis and getting people back, safety, you know, air quality in a building, all those things are really important. So um, ESG would be where I'd go. Well, th thank you. And, and an absolute perfect segue into some of the questions uh, that have come in on, on the chat room. And, and, uh, and, and maybe what I'll do is just try to drive through those uh, and, and apologies if I've not captured the spirit of the question for those who put in, but I will do my best. Um, you know, Craig, you, you, you mentioned uh, ESG and, and, and climate change. You know, here is, here is a question that came in and it's in the, in the chat. You know, the disruption resulting from the pandemic to office design is likely or should be likely to pale into insignificance compared to the disruption resulting from the climate crisis. What, do, what does the panel think? Uh, and are there any changes arising from the pandemic that may contribute positively to dealing with the climate crisis? And there's another question in, in the chat room about um, uh, carbon footprints and net zero uh, as we look at building. But let's start with this, this one around climate. And, and, and Craig, why don't you lead off with your perspective? Sure. So. I don't disagree with the comment that's made that this is, you know, climate could dwarf the pandemic um, given the, the threat that it's making. Um, and I think the good news is that there's a lot of great technology out there today, which allows us to make leaps and bounds improvements, not only to new buildings that are being built, but also to existing buildings. So um, with a little bit of investment, significant advances can be made. And I think um, that's something that uh, users are going to demand of uh, the buildings that they want to work in. Any other comments around that, Michael, Sal, Jonathan? Well, yeah, all I was going to add is I think the two sort of areas of lowest hanging fruit are energy consumption and selection of building materials. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we and I, I'm sure my fellow panelists too are, you know, laser focused on both. You know, whether it's sort of uh, photovoltaic glass, whether it's sort of looking at, you know, net zero. I mean, we've got a net zero building and pipeline in, in, in Montreal, um, a highly innovative sort of mixed use one. 
Um, you know, I mean, this is for us probably, you know, our single most important sort of corporate objective um, and selection of materials. I mean, you know, we, we, we build both, you know, glass and steel towers at Maine and Maine. So sort of creative buildings in neighborhoods similar to what Michael does. And, you know, selection of materials. I mean, it used to be you'd go to Italy and bring the stone for your office lobbies. And I think that is, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, not going to be the way forward. Um, and I think it's going to be use of, you know, more timber, use of, you know, more sustainable type um, uh, structures, but also sort of how the buildings do and, and, the, and the sort of the amount of control that we want to put on our tenants to sort of say, look, if you come lease with us, you know, we want you to sort of commit to these, you know, guidelines and standards as well. So, um, you know, I, I think this is important now and it's only going to get, you know, ever more important. So, yeah, good, good comment, Michael. Yeah, I, I'd add, um, I, I think climate dwarfs the pandemic um, in historical terms or will dwarf it, absolutely. I have great hope actually that importance is being attributed to ESG globally in a way that will see us begin to achieve what we need to achieve to address climate change. And as the CEO of a public entity, I'm perhaps well positioned to, to understand why. And the reason is the providers of capital globally are insisting, they're not asking anymore, they're insisting that major public entities address ESG sincerely and effectively. The reason they're doing it isn't because they've become altruistic. They're doing it because they've noticed a very real correlation between financial performance and attention to corporate social responsibility. And so they're insisting uh, that companies they invest in pay real attention and meaningful attention to ESG. Otherwise, they'll pull their capital and allocate it to someone who does because they believe their chance of generating a good return on that capital is better with the organization that does. That gives me great hope. So while I believe in follow the people, absolutely, I do think follow the money in certain circumstances still matters and the money is going to ESG. And if public entities don't follow, they will fall behind and ultimately fall right out of the game. Yeah. I would add that uh, what we discussed earlier, ESG just goes further to support longer term intensification you know, within uh, urban, existing urban centers. Because it's just, it's a fundamental make sense prospect in terms of being able to justify the kind of capital in order to make a building you know, carbon zero or net neutral uh, on a larger scale, close to existing infrastructure, et cetera, instead of extending it out to the suburbs. So I think it becomes a, uh, you know, a, a, vir a virtuous uh, circle in, in that regard. Yeah. I wanna pivot to another question here I'm seeing in the chat room. Um, and it, it, it takes us back to, to um, the actual office experience. And, and, and the question is this, could the panel unpick the concept of the differentiated office a bit further? What, what differentiates the differentiated office from a commodity one? And is it ultimately a bit of an arms race? Um, uh, Jonathan, why don't we start with you on that? Sure. I mean, I used that phrase a few times today, so I'm happy to have a go at it. And I, I think it's sort of really um, you know, points to, it, it isn't just one thing. It's the whole experience. It's for the processional from when you enter the front door. I think it's sort of having, you know, a curated type hospitality uh, processional and sense of arrival rather than a stark, sterile corporate lobby. Um, I think the physical space itself, and I, I, I look at Michael and I sort of think, when I think differentiated, I think probably his portfolio you know, ex embodies that probably as, 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 as well as anything. It's, it's, it's space for the soul. Like it's, 
it's higher ceilings, it's, it's, it's light, it's different materials, it's texture, it's timber. I mean, obviously the building systems have to be up to snuff too. And, you know, there's a lot of what I call donor buildings in North America that are sort of 40 and 50 year old, you know, corporate office buildings that were built in like the, you know, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s with punched windows um, and lower ceiling heights and more columns and narrow staircases. And sure, you know, you can do a few things to dress those up, but they're, co they're commodity office buildings, right? I mean, window line matters, um, ceiling height matters, um, you know, access to external amenities matters, the quality and curation of your food and beverage program matters. And I think when I say quality and commodity, certainly what I mean is it's all of the above. It isn't just, you know, this one thing. Um, I think you can also reimagine, you can do a great job reimagining, you know, some older office buildings. And I think with our portfolio, what we've done is we've tried to take a very careful look and sort of say, okay, we've got a collection of sort of new construction sort of trophy type assets. And we've also got a collection of older assets too. And we're sort of saying, we think this one, we can move from commodity to differentiated and we're going to do that. And this one maybe is always going to be commodity, whatever we do to it. Um, so it's probably not long for this world in terms of ownership for us. So whether it's dev redev or, you know, get slated for rotation of capital or sale, that's how we're looking at it. Um, so, you know, I, I mindful of time. So I'll leave it there. Yep. yep. No, good, good point. And, and maybe, We'll, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll end off with this one. And then Robin, I, I see there's more of a BCO related question that I'll throw to you at the end and then, and, and then have you take us home. But this one is interesting. It, some employees might be anxious to return at all. Uh, how will leaders need to respond to that? For example, might they continue holding virtual meetings even when 95% of the staff might be in the office? Uh, what, what are the panel's thoughts on that? Craig, maybe start with you. Yeah, so I, I think it's a very good question. There's no question that we're going to have to be flexible as we move forward in terms of using the technology that we have uh, available to us to accommodate what uh, the users want. You know, if there's some people who refuse to move back. And quick story, I talked to an associate who's a senior executive at one of the banks who has decided to move to Wolfsville, Nova Scotia permanently. And he's working remotely forever. I thought, wow, bold move, but an example of someone who's taking this uh, seriously and, and changing his habits. So we're gonna have to deliver uh, a solution that to accommodates that. Agreed. Michael, Sal, Jonathan, anything to add? I, I'm happy to add one, one small point on that. I mean, I think, um, this fear of missing out is, I, I think that's a real problem. Um, I think, you know, the question is a valid one, but I also think it's going to be one of momentum. And I think people are going to start to come back. And I do believe that, you know, there's going to be a sense of missing out. And if 95% of the people are in the office and, you know, they're, they're in a meeting room and they're collaborating and they're like, okay, we just need to sort of stop everything and get Bob on the phone, you know, who's, uh, who's calling in from Wolfville, Nova Scotia in his, uh, in his PJs, you know, I mean, is that really, you know, going to happen? I mean, you know, one of the things about agile hybrid is everyone thinks they want it. We don't really know if it's going to work. We right. think it could, and we think technology as an enabler should remove friction to a degree, but at the end of the day, I mean, do the people who choose to stay away, do they self-select themselves to a slower career trajectory? Do they, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to these questions. You know, it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you choose to be remote, then, you know, the next logical jump in thought is, well, why do you need to be in Wolf, North Nova Scotia? Why couldn't you be in Mumbai? And, um, you know, so there's a bit of that too, right? And you sort of, you know, you almost got to be a little bit careful what you wish for. Um, so I think it's a delicate balance. I think as an employer, I mean, we obviously have to be flexible, respect the needs uh, of our different employees, their personal circumstances, and what may or may not work for them. Um, but we also have to, you know, I, I think uh, probably put a bit of policy around it, or at least some guidelines, because uh, otherwise it has the potential to sort of descend into the Wild West. And, 
it'll be a really interesting. I mean, Mike said it earlier. We, we don't know how this is going to go. Um, but, you know, w w whatever we think is going to happen, it'll probably be something else. And that's the danger of making these decisions in the now. But that's actually probably a good a good place to to end it and sum it up. It it, it who knows what the future is going to hold. But but I'll, I'll turn it over, Robin, to you in a quick second. And I see there is a question in the chat room about is the BCO planning to review the recommended fresh air ventilation rates in offices and the importance of that. I don't know if you want to address that now or, or with the group, but but as I sign off, uh, just we've heard a lot of great things in our visit today, a lot of great lines and words and renaissance, uh, back to the future, one size does not fit all, uh, improved visibility. These are all things that resonate. And one thing is for certain, um, it's not going to be the same as it was before. And, uh, and, and time will tell in a lot of these open questions. So thank you to the panel for your uh, insight and sharing your perspectives today. Uh, and Robin, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chuck. Um, yes, we I have uh, instigated a, a complete review of the BCO specification, um, and we've got a, a panel running at the moment who are sitting down and reviewing it all, and that'll include.